What I'm here to sort of talk about is the, fa uh, the Métis Nation Registry, uh, a little bit of a history of it, and how we processed everything after the Pauli decision and the national definition was adopted by our province. Uh, I guess there's a really, unless there's somebody that's, uh, is there a, oh. Maybe if you change, move your page this year, then we may have changed. No. Okay. Well, well, too much technology up here. Okay. So, uh, now I'm like Robert, I have to take my glasses off because I can't see up close. So prior to 1991, in 1991, the president of um, uh, Alberta was Larry DeMille. And himself and some other uh, provincial leaders, uh, they decided that they were going to proclaim themselves as a nation of people rather than an association. So he, um, he took great strides in ensuring that he laid the foundation for what that was going to look like. So prior to 1991, uh, the membership applications uh, were taken at the uh, local community level, uh, regional office level, and they had the capacity to just issue membership cards. Well, that got a little bit tricky sometimes, especially around election time. Now, the, um, so in 1991, when Larry decided to centralize uh, the membership granting process, um, we started, we started uh, that process. I was there at that time as well. And then after the Pauli decision, in September of 2003, we got our first uh, minimal funding to start developing an objectively verifiable uh, process. So this process allowed us to uh, have some dedicated staff we got department status, uh, and I was a director slash registrar of that department. The first secure barcoded Métis ID cards were issued in 2006 to the 14-member provincial council. They were printed by an off-site uh, Winnipeg firm. I believe they still use that same, that same company. you know what, some of this stuff is going to, you know, because I was making changes on the fly, so you have to excuse me and I'll blame my hair. <laughs> okay, so the next slide basically, uh, yeah, so this is it. Okay, so the next one. What we found with that was um, this new process that was, uh, we we're trying to establish and 2004, it, meant, it met with a lot of opposition from existing members. And this, about this time, we had probably about, I'm gonna say about 10,000 members who were in the province, who had received these cards. They were very basic. They were laminated. Uh, if you were lucky, you could put your picture on it. Um, and everybody had one of these in their back pocket. So they would show up with these cards and depending on where they obtained it, sometimes they didn't even have a file in our office, so that caused a little bit of a uh, challenge to try and, and match all those people. So it was a t about a 10-year period that we operated with um, a two-card system. Now that presented all kinds of challenges because even though there were many times that people came to an AGM to say we need to get rid of the red and white cards, they, uh, we would demonstrate that so many people got the new card, uh, but we were still always being outvoted by the holders of the red and white cards because they just did not want to give those up for whatever reason. I'm sure they had, they thought they had a valid reason. So after uh, 2013, uh, they were all canceled because by now we had issued more new cards and we were able to demonstrate that these cards were far superior to the red and white cards. We were able, for instance, using the, bar the barcode system, we were able to register people for our AGMs really quickly. And it 
after a while, people started to see that there was definitely some benefit to having these new cards. Now, the weird thing about all of this is the Métis harvesting issue was never a priority in our province. Okay. They had signed uh, an interim harvesting agreement with one um, government. A new government in Alberta came into place and they threw that out. So consequently, that whole concept or that whole idea about having the right to harvest uh, was kind of shelved. So it became more of an undertaking of how many people can we register? It becomes a numbers game. Okay, so there never was any understanding uh, between the MNAA and the province that these people had rights. Okay, and that, that carried on until this past year uh, when they did actually finally sign under the UCP government, they finally signed a, a harvester's agreement. The appeals process was another thing. <laughs> We have within our bylaws uh, an entity called the Métis Judiciary Council. Unfortunately, that has not been functional for, uh, I'm going to say approximately five years. Even though time and time again at AGMs, our members were calling for the reinstatement of the Judiciary Council. The Judiciary Council was uh, dissolved by our provincial council. And a lot of it had to do because there were uh, a lot of, um, a lot of complaints that were uh, tabled with the judiciary council against our elected leadership. So they were not ready to go down that road. So the, the quickest thing to do was uh, just to kind of put and shelve the, judici the Judiciary Council. It's, stall it's still, I'm not sure how effectively it's functioning these days. I have very little contact with the Métis Nation of Alberta, although I still have people who will occasionally phone me from there with little tidbits. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So the national definition of Métis. Now, so my job was to create a foundation that would develop a objectively verifiable process. I had the distinct ability that, I'm, and I'm going to say this honestly, was that most of our provincial council didn't have a clue what the hell that meant. So they basically just left me alone to do my thing. Well, <laughs> guess what? That's exactly what I did. And I'm, um, my zodiac sign is Virgo, so I'm very analytical and I'm very, you know, everything's got to follow certain rules and, and regulations. So I collected all that together with my staff and we started to develop a process. When we talk about the uh, self identifying as a Metis person, the application forms that we developed included a section where the applicant could actually self-identify as a Métis. By, by a checkbox, uh, they could identify if they were Indian, Inuit, non-status, uh, Métis, or non-Aboriginal. We would get some really interesting tick marks there, you know, where people would say, well, I'm not an Indian and I'm not Inuit, so I guess maybe I'm a non-Aboriginal? Okay. <laughs> is of, his, uh, of historic Métis Nation ancestry. Whoops. Okay, we already covered that. So all the applicants were required to complete a family tree to at least the mid-1800s. And we established a genealogy research center right as part of our registry uh, process. Uh, and its purpose was to assist applicants uh, research their ancestry. We had two dedicated genealogists and a couple of assistants who would work with the people to and work and stay with them until they actually found the documentation that they needed um, because this was in the um, sort of in the early, um, about mid 2000. 
So it was sort of a, um, uh, it kind of threw people into a bit of a panic because in the old system, you just came in and said, I want a membership card. And they said, oh, okay, well, fill this. They give you a genealogy sheet. You kind of put your name, your mom and dad's name, maybe your Muslim and Kukum on both sides, and that was it. Then they hired, or they, they, we had a volunteer genealogist at that time, and she was just a lady that did it as a, as a hobby. She'd come in and she'd look and she'd, she'd look at the names and she'd say, you know, she'd check, oh, Métis, Métis, Métis. No backup information, just based on the names. So that just kind of carried on for a while. So we made sure that we, um, that we put a, a, a very uh, strong genealogy research center in place. And people that will uh, help these individuals find their, uh, their links. So we spent a great deal of time assisting individuals. And I was a little bit dismayed this morning when uh, there was uh, the lady that got up and talked about how her sister was having such a difficult time and that they were part of the 60s scoop, uh, they were adopted and so on. So, because that was an area that was a particular interest to me as well and I, and I went f above and beyond to make sure that we, those people had the opportunity to repatriate back to our uh, nation and we helped them. We worked with the post-adoption registry and in several cases, we even assisted in the obtaining of DNA results just to prove uh, lineage so that these individuals who clearly had no idea, um, somebody might have told them, you, you know, you, you have made the ancestry, but they really, really wanted to uh, find a place of belonging. It was amazing. I remember this one woman, when she finally got her card, she came in my office and she was crying. And she said, I never in a million years thought that I would be able to accomplish this. Her father came from British Columbia to Alberta so that they could undergo a DNA testing together. And she definitely was Métis. So we had a lot of success stories. Uh, so it, was all, it wasn't all doom and gloom. We had, a lot, we had a lot of fun. We made sure of that. Um, as far as, uh, and this, this kind of also uh, goes to the uh, historic Métis Nation ancestry. Um, let me see here. This is, oh, okay. Distinct from other Aboriginal people. So each applicant that came in, they had to sign a statutory declaration that was commissioned by commissioner votes to say they were not on the Indian register or on a banned list. Okay, it was their word, it was, uh, we worked with a legal firm to develop the form and we put right on there that, on the form that it was a, an offense to sign this illegally. So they were made aware of the consequences of signing um, um, a bogus statutory declaration. They were also required to sign a letter of authorization to us to contact INAC, I still call them INAC, to confirm that they were not on the Indian registry. Now, we had an excellent relationship with the INAC regional office in Edmonton. And anytime uh, we came to them with any type of uh, request for assistance or verification, they were there. In the beginning, everything went through by letter. And eventually, what was developed was that there was a there was a secure exchange of information, a site that was developed uh, with INAC for this purpose. So we drop everything in there, they pick it up, boom, they send it back to us in a day or two. Where before it was taking up to six months and more to get that uh, report back. In addition, there was another site that was created uh, about 2016, 2017, we were always, um, now I was gone by then, and my daughter Tracy had taken over the, the role of the registrar. And she negotiated with INAC, uh, and together they built a site in I, f with INAC in Ottawa, which had the potential of running the entire membership registry 
to identify which individuals applied for treaty status after they applied as Métis. It was, we were so excited. And I, I remember when she called me, she said, Mom, I did it. I got this uh, put in place. And she said, now I'm going to present it to the provincial council and I'm going to get their authorization to go ahead and we'll run. At that time, we probably had 35,000 people in the system. She took it to the provincial council. No, she would, they would not authorize her to run our membership through that system. It would have taken approximately 10 minutes. And so we were, we never did get, uh, she never did get that. Now that system is still there if they ever so dis, you know, chose, choose to use it. But like I said, member, uh, numbers are very big in Alberta, members. I'm gonna talk about that too. Okay, is accepted uh, by the Métis Nation. We didn't have an acceptance uh, built into any of our process necessarily. There was no community acceptance process like I heard uh, my colleague talk about at MMF. It wasn't the communities who decided. Instead, the provincial council made a policy statement that basically said if an applicant met all of these mandatory requirements, it automatically said that they met all the criteria to be accepted by the Métis Nation. So it ultimately basically kind of left uh, the communities out of the decision-making process. Uh, they probably had people in their communities walking around with a car that they didn't even know were Métis, you know, so it was, that was one of the deficiencies I felt was that there was no community involvement in that whole process. Okay, I just have a couple more. Why are Métis registries necessary? And I think uh, my colleague uh, touched on uh, some of that. Uh, we know it's an important role of Métis governing bodies to assert Métis rights for their Métis community members. That's huge. Especially after the, um, the Supreme Court decision on Pauli. And the verification of a claimant's membership in a relevant contemporary community is crucial. Oh, three minutes, they said. Okay, so you guys read that real fast. Okay, and self-identification, ancestral connection, and community acceptance are factors. Oh, well, I'll, I'll take it up with him later. <laughs> two minutes, I'll say. You owe me two minutes now. Okay. What affects the integrity of uh, the registry? The biggest thing that we found towards the latter part of the time that I was there, and definitely when Tracy was there, was the political interference. We were being required to approve applications that do not meet the national me uh, definition of Métis. And a lot of that had to do with, uh, you know, people would go, we'd say no, you know, we don't, you, don't, you don't qualify or you, you, know, you, you don't meet the definition, blah, blah, blah. They had no judiciary counsel to go to to appeal their decision, right? To appeal our decision. So they would take it to the political body, to the president mostly. And then down would come, you know, and most of the time it would be for a political expediency. There was an expectation for us to accept documentation that did not prove dissent. And it would be something silly like, oh, well, there's his name and, uh, you know, and it's it, it, no last name or anything. Uh, we, we were, in some cases, we used things like obituary statements, you know, where we, we were a little bit leery of some of that stuff. Um, others were things like, oh, she's the daughter of uh, Ralph, Ralph Klein's wife, uh, and you know, and Colleen is my friend, and she could do so much for my political, blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's fine. Okay. The other one is a non-compliance of the CSA standard document. I remember how hard we worked on that, how much we argued when we would meet to develop that. And finally, we had a document that we all felt like we could bring home and implement and we'd be good to go. 
I was so excited when we got, and the MNC approved that document for implementation. It came home, so, you know, we were all, I told my registry staff, okay, we're gonna do this implementation of the CSA standard, and we were told, under no circumstances, are you gonna apply any of that? So, that was shelved. This is the scary part. You'll, we hear all the time about um, the 42,000 people. We hear this a lot in Alberta. Oh, we have 42,000 members. Those 42,000 applications have been in, the, in that system since 1991. Now, you can't tell me that people haven't moved out of the province. Some people have even passed away. And some people probably got their treaty status. But they're still there because we need that number. And we, when we built the database, we built in an automatic five-year review. And when that review would come up, I would do a report and say, here are all the files that we have to review, make sure these people are still around. I was told, no, never mind that. And the non-availability of, of, uh, of an appeals process is a real huge, huge um, problem for people who are applying. So, safe to say I cannot, I cannot speak to the integrity of the MNA registry since 2017 when my daughter left there. And there's those 42,000 registered members. We hear that all the time in news releases. Oh, I represent all these people, blah, 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 blah. And I think to myself, okay, why do we have such a problem getting 300 people at an AGM for a quorum if we have that many people? So there is no way to determine as the MNA leadership will not agree to the review of the membership registry. So coming here today uh, and speaking about what it took me for 10 years to build and baby through the growing pains and that whole process, I'm really, really sad about the state of our registry. Very, very sad about what it's, what it's arrived at. And it's even going to be sadder because we would have people coming that had tied back to Ontario, uh, Penetangosheen, uh, Mattawa, and places like that. And we always said, no, you're not part, you're not, you're not us. And so we constantly denied those applications. Last year at the AGM, I saw people that I personally denied as a registrar walking around with one of these. They were delegates because they had been issued membership cards, even Moniawak. So I know it's, it's, uh, it's a system that works. And I really think that as leaders, you guys need to start talking about a national registry process. That is the only way that we're going to maintain the integrity of our registries registering our true Métis people.